Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and I have the very special privilege today to be interviewing Kim Butler of Perpetual Wealth, um, who my wife thinks is the OG legend of this industry, which uh, is a funny thing we just had a funny conversation about, um, and Todd Langford of Truth Concepts, who probably the best numbers guy in this business, uh, has some of the best calculators, um, and I'm just really excited to have you guys on here because um, you know, we we were just talking a little bit beforehand, um, and we met, uh, I think, for the first time at Caleb's and Asset Mastermind event. And uh, so, you guys, after hearing um, Todd talk, and obviously Todd, I've seen a lot of your content over the years. I've had Truth Concepts, I've used it. It's it's, I've made some videos actually with it as well, which has been cool um, and helpful. And so, like, I th I think. Um, what I'd love to talk about today with you guys is just kind of like an overall state of the industry, um, you know, talk about uh, different ways to utilize whole life insurance and 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 help people build wealth, create wealth, mindsets around wealth, like just all this stuff. Like, quite frankly, I don't have a like a, you know, a, a, a schedule planned out for what to talk about. But I just think it, I, I love hopping on with brilliant people like you guys, people with hearts of service that want to help people and just have a conversation about what what we can do to help give people information to make better decisions to get to their goals. And so thanks for being here. And I, I just for a moment, I'd love for each of you, if you could just take like, I don't know, 60 seconds or so to kind of introduce yourself, talk about what you have going on right now. Because Kim, I know you have a book uh, that you're, you're spinning back up and you just showed me some amazing earrings if you want to show everybody else. That is like super cool. Like It makes me for my new book launch because I got a book coming out too. It makes me want to get earrings. I don't know. Like, it's, <laughs> like you could. I don't, <laughs> maybe the clip on version, you know, no. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, uh, I'm sure they would like hang on your ear somewhere. Just tape them on. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, my assistant, Teresa got these and I don't know that the camera is going to pick them up, but got these adorable earrings made of the front and back. It's an actual book. Like there's little pages in it it's what? the front and the back of the book it's incredible she got it done on etsy uh That's teresa at prosperity thinkers if you want to know where you know because i don't know who on etsy did them i just know teresa gave them to me they mean the world to me that everybody knows brilliant. what a heavy lift a book is right so this is our perpetual wealth we have a book we have a workbook we well, have a family legacy game. You know, I'm like all green and branded today, right? <laughs> that, that's awesome. So thank you. That's it's amazing. a joy to be able to put that kind of thing out. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. I got to get that book and, and read it as well. I haven't seen it yet. So that's that's fantastic. And so that's amazing. And Todd, you um you are just like doing, I, do you have any new projects? Or are you like just cranking along and, and just keep improving truth concepts and running your stuff and doing that and just being, being the man in that. Yep. That's, that's pretty much it. I, 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 uh, you know, the more I dig into the numbers, the more I see how powerful this tool is that we just sometimes take for granted. You know, we look at it on the surface, we look at some of the pieces, but the real piece is how that digs into the strategy of what somebody's doing, not just for now or between now and the next 10 years, or even, between now and quote retirement age, not a, not a word we like to use, but I'll use that because I think most people understand what that means. But after that point, the impact that it's going to have on people's lives and the ability it has to be able to, to just more efficiently allow them to use their money is incredible. And so it's the long-term picture that makes this just a fabulous tool. And so often in the financial industry, we all want to look at well, what is it in this first 10 years? What is it in this first five years? Well, that's that, that, that's that's just not reality. We're going to be living a long, long time. And with the exponential increases in medicine, holy cow, who knows what mortality uh, timeframes are going to be. And so we need to be prepared for the long run and in whatever that means. So giving up a little bit sometimes on the front to see what we have on the back um, is really what, what people need to be doing, right? That absolutely. I actually just did a video on the different ways whole life insurance can help you during different phases of your life to get really people to understand how important it is because it's like there's no other asset in the world that will grow with you the way that this does and solve different problems at different phases of your life, right? Like that, like as you hit different benchmarks and different needs, like you literally go, all right, I've used it for this to this point, but now 
I can flip a switch and use it for this. And now it'll solve this problem. And now it'll solve that problem. And it's like, nothing else will do that. There's not another asset in the world that will solve problems and help you in different ways and different stages like whole life insurance. And so, yeah, I, I completely, completely agree. And I guess that's that's even something for me, like as, as my evolution of what I do uh, kind of grows, like when I first started selling whole life insurance and, and, and being in the insurance business at all, I started as an IUL guy. I don't know if you guys know that, but in two, from 2009 to 2014, I was a director of business development for one of the top IUL companies in the country. Um, wow. And so, and, and it was, that was that experience and my journey with them. And the deeper I got, the more I got to learn, the higher the level of people I got to talk to, the more annual reviews I had to see. And the more, you know, like you see all this. Those are killers. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, what is going on? Like, this isn't what I thought I was doing. And then, then I started questioning everything. And, and I was like, well, what do, what do I need to do? And I started, and I found whole life insurance, you know? And I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is, this is what I thought I was selling the whole time, you know? And, and it's, um, oh, Hannah's fixing my computer here. And, and, and it's, I don't know. It was just like one of those things. Like for me, I had this like epiphany kind of aha moment, like, holy crap, like I need to, I need to really let the world know that, that this is the case, that this is happening, that people are being misrepresented, that IUL is actually one. And, and this is why I kind of put this out online. And, and this is people, people ask why I'm so passionate about it is because when I left that national life, oh, I said the company name, when I left the company, <laughs> I'm going to edit that out. When I, when I left the company and I went out on my own, I got sued and um, I had to give up my licenses guys for four years for, for almost, no, five, five and a half years. I had to give up my licenses because they told me that if I sold and mentioned anything I learned there, they would bury me. And, 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 and that was after I went through a two year lawsuit with them and won, and then was served with another thing right away because oh, my, my last year there in 2014, because of my positioning, because of the fact that I had access to certain people that, and I'm a pretty outgoing guy and make friends with people that maybe I shouldn't be friends with, you know, in places like that. Cause I just, I meet people in the elevator. Right. And you're like, Hey, what do you do? Like whatever. And, and you, you build it, you spin up, you know, relationships and, you know, not with any intent of anything nefarious or anything, but you know, you're just talking to people and meeting people in the, in the office. And then what happened a couple things, like we all hear about lawsuits, right. About, like what's happening in class action lawsuits about, you know, it can happen with whole life as well. And it has in the past. So I don't want to like act like we're immune to that because there are whole life agents that are misrepresenting and doing things poorly as well. And there's, you know, like, I don't want to dismiss the fact that that can happen as well. However, IUL is like, it's a normal occurrence and class action lawsuits are literally happening every year. Now they don't all hit the surface. And I didn't know this. And back then in 2014, I had no idea about this, but I found out that there were three class action lawsuits that were filed and settled and sealed in arbitration that the rest of the world will never even know about, except for the policyholders and the company. Three in one year from one company. Oh. Think about that. Ow. Nine figures worth of settlements in one year. <sighs> and like... It's, it's, it's one of those things where I started seeing that and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're selling this like super safe, super conservative, super predictable illustrated product, right? And, and that's what we're doing. How are, all these, how are all these lawsuits happening like at such a massive level so consistently? And, and so that was kind of my epiphany moment. And, and then I started going to, and I started going to whole, or I started looking and I found whole life and that's what got me. And honestly, Kim, that's when we found your books. Your book was actually the first book I ever read. Um, and, uh, and, and I still have, uh, like a bunch of your books on my bookshelf at home. I'm not home right now. I wish I were, I'd pull them off and, you know, <laughs> but, but like the live, the live your life insurance book. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so, um, you know, I had, I had that book and I read a couple others, obviously I read, I, I went through, I went down on like a rampage of just like reading every book possible and, um, you know, and I was just like, wait a minute, like, and it's interesting because like I saw a guy the other day, um, a IUL guy that was using Garrett Gunderson's book to sell IUL. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, if Garrett knew this, his head would explode, you know, Absolutely. like, like <laughs> but people misrepresent people use Nelson Nash's book to sell IUL. And it's like, did you even read the book? Like you're, you're using it. 
but did you read it? Because, ah. So what I'd love actually before, before going any further, like I want to take a, like a step back and I want to hear from you guys, like, because I know my um, kind of epiphany aha moment. I would love to hear like your stories about like, when did you find out about whole life insurance? When did you kind of have this aha moment where you're like, because you both have done such bold things in this industry and, and have made such wild impacts on, on like thousands and thousands of agents. Right. And, and like, you're passionate about this. And so I would love to hear like, what, what was the moment that you kind of realized like, oh my gosh, this, this is my calling. This is what I need to be doing. And here's why. I can't wait to tell that story. May I go first? Yes, please. So I also came from a UL and VUL background, loved those products, not really sure why I attached myself to life insurance in general, but I just did, but it was under typical financial planning environments Uh and VUL for the most part. Okay. A little of variable whole life, interestingly enough, when that product existed. Okay. Just enough, I think, to be able to realize when I met Todd Langford and started to learn his software, I was a student in a room, probably the only woman in, you know, a class of 30 or 50 guys learning the software. Yeah. I started to see the distinctions. And like you, I was horrified. I had five years of clients and I had a pretty nice practice. I worked very, very hard at it. I had five years of clients I had to go back to and say, I'm sorry. Those are hard conversations. Oh my gosh. The worst. I I did not know what I know now. And let's, let's please make some changes. And yep. so that was in 1995 or somewhere around there. Okay. And then I just started layering on the learning Love it. and I attended more of Todd Langford's software classes That's to, awesome. and I'm, I am not numerical. I am as conceptual <laughs> as they come. <laughs> totally. <laughs> And so the way that I got over that is I would go to class because I, I couldn't do the work myself or I wouldn't (laughs) important distinction that Todd likes to remind me of, because we all can do what we need to do, but it was just easier to, to listen to Todd and have it shoved in my brain so much that I was able to speak with so much more confidence Because even though I might not be able to replicate the calculator, Mm. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes, sliced and diced 14 different ways in the classes. And so I was able to convey that in my voice and my confidence. And I actually started doing work over the phone because the internet was literally just coming you know, into fruition in 98, 99. Yeah. There was no streaming video back then. No, no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But because of the confidence in my voice, because of the confidence in the numbers that I got because of the calculators, I was able to help people see the positive possibilities of whole life, which is a Vince Dodona quote that I love forever. I am a, a big positive fan. Positive possibilities of whole life. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Any word that starts with P for prosperity is a good word. <laughs> there you go. No, that's awesome. And so you, interestingly to that story, like as I'm hearing the dates for people that are listening and aren't aware of this, like, first of all, Todd, that just shows how long you've been doing the calculator stuff, which is amazing. <laughs> Secondly, um, 1995, uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out in there um, is V variable whole life is gone, by the way. And notice okay. anytime people, anytime people try to get creative and, and create different versions or whatever, we, we wind up going back to the OG, you know, like it's like good old traditional whole life is what works. It's what stands the test of time. And there's all these things. You came from the UL and VUL world from traditional planning. You said in 1995, that was two years before IUL even existed. Right. So you have seen, like I entered IUL, I entered the business in 2009 with the, one of the, the company I joined was the top four in the industry. Now they're number one, but like 
as far as volume of sales go. But like, I only knew that, you know, that space when I first joined. So you got in for the UL, you guys have been around and watched kind of like the rise of IUL and watched the changes and watched the different sales tactics and watched it on social media and watched the expansion. Like how, like that must be really like annoying and frustrating and hard. Go ahead, yeah. Todd. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. He's like, that's perfect so, for Todd yeah. to answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you asked how we got in, so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the to answer yeah. your questions yeah, a little bit. Ahead, but I think please. it's kind of funny. There's very few people that got into this industry on purpose, right? Right. I, I think yeah. most of us got into it on accident, and it's kind of crazy because it's a uh, there's just no better place. You get to help people yeah. and you get to change generations, right? So it's, it's, it's hu hugely empowering and it's, you know, it's a big responsibility at the same time. And so yeah. I think that's why we're so passionate about the whole life side because it is a big responsibility, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's long-term. It's got to be there long-term. It can't just be there uh, if things work out. And so right. when I first got into the industry, again, it was by accident. I didn't raise my hand earlier when I was a kid and say, you know, when they asked, what do you want to do? And everybody was saying fireman or policeman or whatever else. I didn't say <laughs> life insurance guy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I am so uh -huh. thankful that things worked out so that I ended up here, right? And yeah. so um, in those early days, I worked for an estate planner. And so most everything, you know, I was the IBM PC had just come out and, wow. you know, like Lotus was the spreadsheet. Nobody even knows what Lotus is anymore. Right. But I that's do. what made the personal computer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And so I would create these spreadsheets to help with the estate planning side. And, um, and we did some, some, some great stuff in those days, but UL first started coming in and it was really interesting to look at it because a lot of people were saying, well, you know, there's this new whole life product out there. That's half the price. And, and, and that's the way it was determined. And, and, and to me, you know, one of the things that I learned from my mentor was there are no deals in the insurance industry. And, right. and what he meant yeah. was everything is a trade-off between cost and risk for the insurance company. That is true. So the only way something can be half the cost is if it has half, half the risk for the insurance company, right? They've got to shift that risk somewhere for that to happen. So, so no, it's not whole life for half the price. It's a totally different thing, <laughs> okay? Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, and so... When we started looking at it, you know, everybody was saying, oh, you just use the, the illustrated values in your in your presentation. Well, wait a second. The guarantees come apart like 10 or 15 years out. Yeah, but that'll never happen. Uh, and yeah. that was kind of the mantra. And I think, you know, one of the things in the industry is we look at it and say these insurance agents are, are bad because they've done this. But a lot of them, it's, it's not that they're bad. They don't know. They don't know what they don't know. They, they just don't know. And the insurance companies aren't bad either because they're supplying a product that is priced correctly for what it is. Yeah. Right. But there's a disconnect in there into what's being told to the public and what the public hears. And some of that language, I think, is a problem. You know, at the at the conference where I'm where we met you, mm -hmm. um, I asked a question and I asked the wrong question and everything got off the rails and I couldn't get back to what the real question was, unfortunately. So the okay. whole thing was, went the wrong way, but I asked the question of what does permanent mean to you? Mm, yes. And I asked I it to that. somebody who was promoting the you UL really. And, yeah. and that's not the question that matters. The question that matters is what does the public think permanent means? Yeah, that is the that's the real problem. And the public yeah. thinks permanent means it's going to be there from now on, that it's got some guarantees. Yeah. And then you add the word insurance around it, which means to guarantee, right, to insure. Yep. And you have something completely different. And so everybody understands that term insurance mm -hmm. is not going to be there forever. Right. And it's right. sold yeah. as such. Hey, this is temporary. You hope to never get a claim on it. You hope this is pure cost. Everybody's good with that. Yeah. But UL is sold as whole life or people interpret it when they buy it as the same thing as whole life for a lot cheaper. And I don't know if you've ever been on calls, but you know, we talked about earlier Kim's um Kim's presence on the web and other places cause people to call her from time to time when they have issues with insurance that's totally not, not her clients, but just other people. And literally right. getting getting phone calls of somebody in a hospital 
saying my spouse may not get out of the hospital and wow. I just got a notice from my insurance company and they're saying I'm going to have to pay a premium that's 10 times what we've been paying or five times what we've been paying. We don't have the money. Can they really just take this away over that? And the desperation in people's voices and for us to have an answer of, yeah, I'm afraid they can. That's yeah. that just that doesn't cut it. Yeah, it's it's really those UL that 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 was another thing for me that when you started, I started getting orphan clients, right? And like, one of my jobs uh, was training agents, and you know, they give you agents. Um, and, and when you get these rookie agents in the career channel uh, business, and they have all these orphan clients with agencies, so they, they basically say, Hey, Chris, here's a stack of orphans, farm them out to your guys and teach them to make calls and and service them, right? Like that's, and try to find new sales. Like that's just kind of part of the thing, right? Like, and, and then as you start doing that and you go into it and you start seeing like all these policies are like just, and they're not even that old. They're like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old at the time. And they're, they're already having problems, you know, falling apart, falling apart. And the older the individual was, the more uh, apparent the problem was, right. The more obvious the problem was because the older they get and the faster it happens and everything like a lot of times people sell IUL is like a cheaper like you said it's like the new improved right like kind of whole life and it's everything but that right like it's it's a completely different um uh, system in general it's a completely different product and with a completely different set of risks and it looks really good i will i will say this if you if you design an IUL properly the, my biggest passion for doing this is because of the fact that if you design an IUL properly and you sell it to a 20 to 35 year old, that 20 to 35 year old is not even going to know they have a problem until it's too late. That's right. Right. Health, health wise or age wise. Bingo. Because that product, because of the cost of the insurance and the ART annual renewable term inside of the product, they're not even going to know that their issue exists until they're 65, until they're 70. And the problem is, is what I always say, you can't solve long-term problems with short-term thinking, right? Like it's like, you have to be thinking long-term and, and, and don't, don't talk to me about how much it's gonna save you over the next 10 years or 15 years. Talk to me about how it's gonna perform for you when you're 70, which is when you say you wanna use this product for tax-free retirement you know, income, you know, like it, which is every, the way everybody sells IUL. So like, show me what's gonna happen and what the risks look like at that time, not, like all the benefits now, but somehow people just like are like allow themselves to be duped, you know, by these people uh, that are that are representing this product that to me is the most misrepresented thing. And the then the third scary part is the implosion of that policy oh, that man. will cause a taxable event when somebody is in their 90s. Yeah, it's How are they going to overcome that? Yeah, it's it's crazy. A lot of these companies. So, so there's some some companies now are creating um, overloan protection riders, right? Like, sure. which is which is good, which can protect. And there's a couple whole life companies that do that now too. I think Penn and One America are the two companies that offer overloan protection riders now. But like, um, you know, it's it that can be good. But the problem is, if you if you have a taxable event, i.e., the policy blowing up because of policy loans, um, in in before you're 75. There's no company that I, that I know of that an overloan protection rider will protect you before you're, you're the age of 75. And what I believe, if you start pulling income out at 60 or 65, you will have a problem before you're 75. Like, yep. like 85 to 90 percent chance you're going to have a problem before you're 75, in my opinion. And so, like, you know, you look at that, and it's like there there are going to be so many people that have like massive problems if you even get to that point right like because i i do think that you know that's one of the reasons i created the iul challenge are you guys familiar with the iul challenge at all i yes. love it and it, okay. it hasn't been won yet that is such a cool idea so like i and i so i'm doing a, I'm, I'm doing a new version for it um okay so we're keeping the iul challenge for the agents um but it, it's irritating um how how little response I get because people just, and I guess it's good, right? Like I've had a couple people be like, oh, you're going to lose. I'm like, that's great. I, I, I love hearing your confidence, but you're not going to win. <laughs> like, you know, like you think you're going to win. Like, and I, I think they just like talk. I was on a, actually, so um, 
the money multiplier team called me and they asked me to go on a call to help them um, with an IUL case. And I got on and uh, this, this IUL agent, it, it was really hard for me because the IUL agent on the call was straight up just lying, lying, like lying about Yikes. just about the way the IULs work and what they were and how they function. And I just kind of sat back because it wasn't my client. It wasn't, I was trying to be like kind of just super respectful. And then, but eventually I just says, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't listen to this anymore. And like, I was just like, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you lie, like straight up lie about how these products function and like what the risks are and, you know, all this stuff. Like we have to really understand like all the risk profiles and, and where these things can blow up and, and all these things. And he was just like, well, tell me how I'm lying. And I like listed out a couple of things. And it's just like, I don't understand how people, um, you know, get away with this. And then when I, when I said to him, I'm like, well, if, if what you're saying is true, like you would win the IUL challenge. He's like, oh, I'll win. I'll win. I'm like, that's great. Send me, send, send it to me. And I like on the call, I'm like, just send it to me. I'll give you $2,000 today. I'll wire it to you. Like Venmo or like, or whatever you need, man, just shoot it over. <laughs> He's ghosted me. He hasn't, I mean, he was really boisterous in like, you know, whatever on the call. And then he's just like, he ghosted me, you know? And it, it's just like these people, it, it, I swear it's, it's crazy. It cannot be one. And think about it. If an IUL uh, cannot perform up to the illustrated value in the greatest bull run of all time, when it's a product that supposedly takes advantage of upside potential and it doesn't take advantage of upside potential during the greatest bull run, what's it going to do? when we're in a down market, when we're in a flat market, when we're in other markets where uh, obviously um, I think what we just went through was a bit of a unicorn event, right? Like as far as, as far as like a decade long of the kind of growth that we had, I don't know if we'll ever see growth like that again. I mean, maybe if we have a massive crash, we'll experience some, some uptick like that again, which <laughs> could happen. Um, but like <laughs> probably will happen, honestly, but like you know, we'll see, but, um, you know, I, I, so the new IUL challenge though is, is for clients is for clients. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a challenge. It's going to be a six month period where people can submit. It's, it's actually called rescue my IUL. And, oh. and, and for people that have been sold a bad IUL, I'm actually getting a submission and I'm going to, cause I'm, I'm like, listen, because then I get people and I listen, you're, you'll learn this about me. I just call people out. Like I get people like David McKnight and I get people like Doug Andrew. Right. And um, they drive me crazy. Like, I'm not going to put you guys on the hook to say anything. Cause like, whatever. But for me, like Doug Andrew to me is like the worst in the industry. And, and the reason I feel this is because, you know, he's out there pitching this and selling it as like, you know, to me misrepresenting. And he's the coach of all these WFG PHP teams like they all subscribe to his program and he's made a fortune like selling his program and coaching to those guys right and so there's all like he'll 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 go and he'll say oh well i have i can show an illustration you know on the iul challenge when i launched it he did a video showing that oh i could win but i'm not going to submit first of all i don't trust that secondly uh, <laughs> oh yeah i'm not going to submit it but i'll make a video showing and it's just like and, and here's, here's what I want to say. I made the IUL challenge for agents, not saying it can't be one because yes, it could be one. Like I, I do know that if you set the illustration up with the right assumptions back in like 2012 and, and you set the right assumptions, which back then you had the flexibility to do so that you could, it will have outperformed. But if you set those assumptions up to me, that means you were an agent that understood that you were doing it right, that you were educating your client and you deserve the $2,000. Nobody's done that. Nobody's won, right? Because people sure. just don't do it. Um, and so, so he showed one illustration of it, of it working, whether it's authentic and honest or not. I don't know. I don't, it's not really the point. The, and the, the point of, the, of creating the challenge wasn't even to say it's not possible. The point was to take the conversation to the next level, right? And to have a conversation about like, all right, you got one, you've sold thousands of policies over this time. <laughs> That's one, right? Like, like, if it, 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 and if you were to sell these to if a one in 10 worked, if one in 10 worked, that still wouldn't be enough, right? Like, but it's probably one out of a thousand that are actually working for IUL. And that's not a good thing for people. So, what I'm doing with the new um, IUL challenge is more of a rescue my IUL challenge. And it's for clients that have been 
you know, sold a product. Um, and we can only do so much for them, obviously, like especially when surrender charges are so high and policy. I mean, you guys get it. It's tough. Um, but the the policy that is the worst, the person that got hurt the most, I'm going to give a two thousand dollar bonus to. Um, and we're going to like at least give them a little something um, at the end of everything. And and the goal for me is to utilize this as a marketing thing uh, and like Huge opportunity you know, to be a marketing thing to like really show the world like actual policies that people are being sold and and the danger and the problems that it is causing people and how it can be so much different. Well, well one it of the, is, go ahead. Go ahead, son. One of the interesting things uh, at the conference we were at, the pro UL guy was just talking about how, you know, there are things that are done wrong, but the way we handle it is we are careful. We, we monitor this constantly. We yeah. look at it. We see what we have to do, all these pieces and parts. Mm -hmm. and, and okay, so that, that might make it okay. But let's go back to what you said earlier about that huge pile of orphan policies you ended up with. I mean, how long is it, are these people going to be around to be able to monitor that? Right. And so if, if they go out of business, what is the client going to do outside of lapse in the policy eventually? Because somebody else is going to end up as the, as the servicer for that policy, and they may not have the same understanding of how it works. So it just adds a layer of uncertainty. That's just not necessary in something that's supposed to be the certainty asset, right? 100%. And, and even then, like being able to manage it properly, there are still variables that are outside of the agent's control in managing it that that they like to dismiss and kind of put in this world. Like, here's here's what I tell people for, for a guy like that, who is like, oh, I just manage it. Well, guess what? Insurance companies, like people manage ULs too. Even the people that manage ULs, but insurance companies change those so much that it didn't matter what you did as an agent. They changed and people got hurt. And it didn't, it got to the point where, yeah, you can manage them and tell them they got to fund it more, but there's going to come a, a point of diminishing the law of diminishing returns, right? Like you're you're going to start putting so much money and the clients are going to be like, what the heck? You know, like, I don't want to keep putting that much money into the policy. You know, like this isn't what we talked about kind of deal. And for everybody that's like, oh, the life insurance companies aren't out to hurt people. They would never do that. Like, listen, I, I will acknowledge life insurance companies aren't intentionally selling Chris and Kim and Todd policies saying, hey, I want to stick it to Kim and Chris and Todd. Like that's like if we bought an IUL, that's not their intent. But the foundation of the product is designed like the insurance company is not making extra money on it, but the policy features and the levers in it, they have to protect themselves and they have to protect, you know, the, the shareholders or the, 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 if some of the mutual companies that are selling this now, like the, you know, the shareholder, the, the participate participants of the mutual company, you know, it's they have to protect that first, not that individual policyholder. The IULs are the greatest profit source of almost any company like out there because of this fact. And it's like, if, if you know that those things are going to happen and those levers are going to be changed, the and, and if you believe that the insurance company is not going to hurt the client, is going to do whatever they got to do to protect the client because that's how it's all sold, I would say take a quick jump back in history, take a look at how they handled all the UL policies that had problems because this is no different. This is no different. Like go back to 1995 through 2000, what, eight, seven, something like that in that range where there were like the big blow up for about a decade, decade and a half of, of, of ULs. Do you, I mean, you guys were around during that. I wasn't, but I, I'm yep. just like a nerd for history and studying this stuff. So can you speak to that at all, actually? Go ahead, Todd. Well, I mean, the thing about it is nobody knew what it was when it first came out. Like I say, right. it was uh, it was whole life at half the price. And there was so much of that stuff that was minimally funded. And I think the language in that is a problem because, yeah. you know, typically what you hear is minimally funded, target premium and overfunded. And people think target premium means, well, if I hit target, then it'll stay together. Overfunding means I'll end up with more money in there. And the reason they think that, I think, is because if we look at a whole life policy, that premium is guaranteed that it will pay out if we pay that premium. Yep. If we overfund, it's literally overfunding. We're putting extra money in there that's just gonna show up in more cash and more death benefit down the line. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't, that's not the way it works on the UL side. You have to overfund 
to get the thing to work out and target. What was your number that you were talking about um, at the at the conference mm-hmm. that the number of policies on target premium that over half of them will fall 50, apart? 51% of policies will lapse by the time you're 70 on on target funded premium. Yeah. So, I it's mean, how could that be? Shift. It's a shift of risk, very yep. similar to when the defined benefit plans got moved to 401ks. Sure. And it got talked about as a good thing. Oh, you have all this control. Well, human beings that don't have a lot of financial knowledge, yeah. having yeah. control is not necessarily a good thing. And you do have a lot of control with whole life. And that's the thing that makes me the saddest is that the flexibility of universal life is one of its big selling points, no matter what kind of universal life you're talking about. Whole life can be just as flexible if you know what you're doing. But furthermore, as we've talked about, it's a long-term product. It's not designed to be in there and tweaked every year or two. You can, yeah. if you have that long-term view, you'll see the good that's there. And then when you realize that it's good, you want to keep working with it. And so this minimally funded natural vanish space is also really, really hurting people that own whole life, an amazing product that will do its job. And they're trying to put as little in as possible. Well, you just said something, I think that's really key that people might not understand is an IUL with the whole idea of vanishing premium. Um, it's illustrated that way. People kind of will write illustrations and show you funding it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, boom, no more premium in a, in a whole life policy. And Todd, maybe I'll have you talk about that. Cause you're like the numbers guy and like, you know, whatever, but, but with a whole life policy, if it, there will come a time, whether you do a limited pay, a full pay, whatever, and you always have the option to reduce paid up and, and have the policy paid up. If you come into a situation, I'm not a big fan of doing that, but like, it's always an option in, in case of emergency break open glass kind of thing. Like it's an option, right? You can pay the policy up with a, with a, an, uh, any UL ch- chassis platform, whether it's IUL or traditional UL, you can never pay that insurance up. And so like every year the risk gets compounded, Right. Like, so can you, can, do you, do you have any background, like looking into that at all and kind of seeing how that progresses as the policies age? Well, and sure. The- and that, that's one of the, that's really one of the big things. And you really laid it all out. It's yeah. whole life policy is paid up at some point in time and you can pay it up shorter than that. And it's guaranteed to be paid up. Mm-hmm. A UL policy never gets paid up. So think about this, just if I know I'm guaranteed to have a lump sum of money dump into my state at some point in the future, mm-hmm. does that change my ability to spend my other assets today? Totally. Yeah. So I can right. spend them in a way that's way more efficient because I know it's like, you know, I know I'm going to win the lottery sometime in the future. Okay. So that number is guaranteed to come into my estate. And so it totally changes my strategic possibilities during that distribution phase to where I can make it as efficient as possible. Now let's switch gears with that and look at the UL. Let's say it survived all the way through the accumulation period. Now we get into the distribution period. I can't, since it's never paid up, and it's all dependent on whether I can have enough money on that escalating cost, that increasing cost that's going up over time. Yeah. I have to make sure I have enough cash for that to be there the whole time. So I can't guarantee that that lump sum is going to fall into my assets, fall into my estate. So I can't take that risk of leaning on that policy. It just becomes something that might be, but not something that's going to change my ability to spend my other assets correctly. Right. Not only that, like, so to make this where I did a video on this, it was actually a video in response to David McKnight and David McKnight kind of made, I don't know if you guys know this, but he made a video attacking me about uh, debunking my perspective on IUL, right? And it was, it was very laughable because he made like this 14 minute, like quippy video um, the way he does. And then I made an hour response video because that's just what I do. And, and, (laughs) and I, and I was like, oh, that's great. And I, I bulleted his points out. And then I went through an illustration of his favorite product, you know, and I, and I kind of, and in this, and I bring this up because in this, I, I, I go through and I show when you take, um, when you take a product like IUL, and then you start showing 
the income out of it. And let's say you start taking income at 60 and you're taking a hundred thousand dollars a year of income from your IUL, which is very common, right? Like on illustrations and the way people are yep. selling, it's common, oh, yeah. right? I mean, we see it every day. And so start taking income at 60. By the time you're 75, you've got a couple million dollars, maybe like two and a half to $3 million in loans, because it's not just $1.5 million of income. You have all the loans that are happening. Now, what's happening is your when you run the illustrations, they're all being run on a positive 50 basis points of arbitrage because of AG 49A not being updated properly. And then not like, even now that's still in play, which is just to me a travesty, but like that 50 basis points of arbitrage on the illustrations with the indexed loans, the way the IUL works, that's how the illustrations work. But the reality is it's not going to work like that every year. And so what I did is what, what happens is you see on this, like there was a couple million dollars of cash. They're able to take a hundred thousand dollars a year of income out. They do that. But before you know it, the loan value is way higher than the cash value. The, the net cash value has dropped to like $500,000. But because of the positive arbitrage, right, that's illustrated, <laughs> they're still able to, they're still able to show the income being perpetual on a non-guaranteed basis, by the way, but it, they're show, that's how they're selling it. So I showed this one thing where they sell this product as upside potential, downside protection. Obviously we hear that every day, but I showed like, because of the loan risk, right? Now you had, it was like $500,000 of cash value and you're a numbers guy. And I know a lot of people uh, like listening to this may be getting confused, but I'm speaking to you, I guess. The um, like $500,000. And then what happens is, if you have a negative year or like, let's not even call it a negative year. Let's call it a flat year in the market, a 0% year, not even a negative 20%, which is how they sell it. Like down, you can't lose in an IUL. This is how you lose in an IUL. You can't lose during the accumulation years, except for mortality charges, which are low and won't be catastrophic. It's during retirement when you're using this for loans, when these things blow up, because now you got $2 million, let's just call it $2 million of loans. You got $500,000 of net cash value. And you have a zero year, but you have a 5% loan cost, right? So where, where does that come from? You take your income of 100,000, but now you have a loan charge of an extra on 2 million, 5% is what, $100,000, $100,000, yep. right? So now you've got an extra $100,000 loan cost, but you only have $500,000 in net cash value in there, but you got to pay that extra cost. So where does that come from? It comes from the cash value. Right, yeah, And they're not going to know it either. They're not going to know. It. So that $500,000 that you had in net cash value goes to what? 400000 Because that $100,000 yep. has... So what is that? That's the, a 0% year in retirement winds <laughs> up being a 20% loss to your net cash value. Yep. People don't realize that. No, because of the way it's sold. It's sold of exactly. all upside potential without having to participate in the down market. And that's just absolutely false. And those loans that you take inject infinitely more risk, infinitely yep. more risk, and that you cannot control. And they're sold with the upside of the arbitrage, but the downside risk of that. And that's where that's where I love talking to Bobby Samuelson, because he talks about like the reason whole life insurance is so great is because you, you know what is going to be. The rules are in place. It's like the economy. It's like politics. It's people need certainty. The higher the level of success you are. And I think this is why the most successful people in the world love whole life insurance and why the the you know people that are a little less educated when it comes to personal finance get sold on IUL because they don't understand it successful people in any economy in any market in any business in any anything they can be successful if they know the rules of the game if they know the certainty behind anything that's going to happen and that's the beauty of whole life insurance compared to IUL plus the IUL space is an attempt at yeah. getting something for nothing. Ah, that's a great, speak to that, please. Well, our society wants to eat at McDonald's, but look like Superman or Superwoman. Yeah. And we think that we can pull that off or we think that we can have this amazing income, but we only want to give a little bit to our jobs. There's so many elements of a desire to get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. And inherently we know that doesn't work, but it doesn't keep us from trying. And so people that feel like they might be able to get it, that something for nothing are going to be mm -hmm. 
intrigued by the apparent opportunity of what the index universal life in particular, and I'm sure variable universal life was sold the same way. I mean, I don't even remember, but it is so appealing sounding Mm -hmm. and so sexy. And that's why marketing works well with it. It's that sizzle with absolutely zero stake behind it. Unless you die early. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you, yeah. And, and and let's speak to that for a second, right? Because when we, when we were at the conference, that ev- the defense for everybody that was like, why can't we just stop fighting the IUL versus whole life? It's insurance. Like, so we let's get the insurance on them. It's like, okay, I get it. Like, yes, if you die early, we want to get them insured. Is having an IU like people are like, is having an IUL better than having nothing? And I like, I still don't know how I feel about the answer to that. You know, like I, like, I mean, the answer is yes, obviously, from an insurability perspective, like you want them to have insurance. But I would say if that's the route, I would just get people in a convertible term policy. You know, like if that's right. if you need insurance, do a convertible term policy. If you're uncertain, do cheap term, do cheap term, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, like whatever it know. is. Yeah, exactly. Like do a term policy before you do a UL policy, because, you know, like just do that. And then and then when your cash flow gets better, because there are a lot of people that don't have the cash flow to, you know, to fully fund a whole life policy. You know, and a lot of times, heck, I had a conversation with somebody uh, a couple of days ago, um, you know, and they were like, I really want a whole life policy and I really want to fund this thing and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like talking to him and I'm like, dude, you are not even close to ready to do this, you know? And it's like, let, let's, let's lock in. But he was like 52 and he was worried about his insurability. And he's like, I need to get it locked in. And I was like, well, why don't we just get you like a 10 year convertible term? And we'll work on getting you set up. We'll work on getting locking in your insurability. We'll like, let, let's create a system and a plan to get rid of your debt and do all these things like to get you where you want to be. And that then when you're ready, like then you can, you know, you can go there because the insurance part is important, right? He had that need, you know, right. he's, he's got family he wants to take care of. He's got three kids. He's got all these things happening. And so like, and, and that's, that's another thing that is an area. And I'd be curious to hear your guys thoughts on this because Todd, you're the, you're the calculator guy, right? Like, and I'd be curious to hear about your perspective on people using whole life insurance to pay off debt. Um, because this is a big thing. And I have my opinions that uh, honestly, I'm still working on fleshing my opinions out on this completely. Um, because like, there are situations where I think it can work. But I think most of the time, in my opinion, it doesn't work the way that it's sold. And I have a challenge with uh, a lot of the sales systems out there that are selling uh, whole life as like a debt elimination program, if you will. Um, my my experience, and I guess I'll just say it so you can maybe re-educate me because like I trust you implicitly with this stuff, is like my perspective is if you have a lump sum of money and you have some like let's say a hundred grand that you could front load a policy and then fund a policy and you want to refinance your debt into a whole life policy and do it that way, then that can be a great way to do it. But the people that say, Hey, I've got uh, 20,000 in in credit card debt and uh, I want to, I want to pay $5,000 a year in my policy. And then I'm going to borrow against that policy and pay down the thing. And then uh, create this whole system that goes around to me. That's just like wildly inefficient because I have 20% you know, when you, when you fund a policy, you're still losing capital access. And so there's an inefficiency and inability. I'm, it's creating more expense over here for a period of time. And that 20% interest that I'm paying on the credit card debt, so to speak. Right. So to me, the, the wins of like ne- the uninterrupted compounding of the cash, right. Is, is totally beaten up and negated by the, the opportunity cost of the extra 20% you know, that I'm, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year of lack of access to that capital that account, I could have just accelerated the payments of that immediately. Am I wrong? You're right on. Here's the thing. And, and you know, you have to look at it. I, one of the answers we have to give on a lot of this stuff to, to actually do the best thing to the clients is say it depends. And it yes, always depends on somebody's situation. There's no sure. always on right. on any of it without that other info. But literally what happens in so many of those um gimmicks or marketing ploys of this is why you do that it's just shifting the debt it's not getting rid of it if i if if i have a loan at the bank yeah and i take out another loan to pay that loan off am i out of debt have i done anything 
Nope. No, and it's the same thing here. I'm taking out a loan with the insurance company. So if I shift debt from what I have over here to a loan with the life insurance company, I haven't gotten rid of any debt. I just moved it to another financier, right? right. And and now the rates may be different. And so there would be a consideration of, to, sure. well, maybe that works. You know, if we've got 18% credit card debt, 20% credit card debt, shifting that over to a loan at the at the insurance company, but then be discipline to actually paying that thing off. That's that's yeah. another piece of that equation, right? It may totally. be that the credit card limit caps keep us from having even more. Yeah. And so now we're pushing money into a life insurance policy that the reason the credit card debt exists in the first place may have been a cash flow problem. So now we've added additional cash flow problem in the form of premiums and right. we're expecting people right. to pay it off. And we look at it down the road and say, well, this this didn't work at all. You didn't get any of your debt paid off. Well, yeah, because we put them in a position where they were still cash strapped, right? That was and exactly so it all depends guy. on the situation. But this idea that all of a sudden we're just going to throw money in life insurance policy and borrow money and pay off debt, that's that's way too surfacy. We have to look deeper into that and find out if that really works, depending on what the client situation is. How you just described that was exactly this guy that I was talking to. He was just like, and he had watched some of the videos of some of the companies that have sales systems that talk about it. And and I just was like, no, dude, like, it's not going to work for you. Like, it, it, like it, you could do whatever you want. I'm like, if you know, but it's not going to help you get where you want to be faster. Like, the, that's not the fast track to to your desired goal and result, right? Like, so, yeah, wow. There's there's so much there's so much to this, guys. Um, I, I mean, I know we're at like an hour now. I could do this literally. Well, I could do do this at least three more hours personally because I got to go play in the main <laughs> event of the World Series here in about uh, three hours, but. Um, is there anything, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you guys were like hoping to cover at all? Like, cause I, I mean, I, I literally could keep going, but. I just really encourage people to figure out how they learn best yeah. and then seek material that supports that because there's massive amount of books out there. There's mm -hmm. tons of YouTube videos out there. There's lots of podcasts out there. Most of the books are on audibles also. Mm -hmm. And and really be open-minded. I mean, if you're a consumer, go into it with an open mind and, and really trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're an agent or an advisor, you have to almost open your mind even more because typically the agent advisor person is going to come with some prior education about the space. And it's so important to remember that whole life as a product has existed at least 160, 70, 80 years, possibly even more like 200 to, I mean, if you really, in fact, I'd love your opinion on this. Yeah. You look back at some of the history, there's, there's up to 600 years ago, yeah. elements of a whole life product with a mutual yeah. style company spoken about. And so it doesn't matter to me what your emotions are around it. I mean, I have people say, I hate whole life really? It doesn't hate you. <laughs> Remove the emotion. Look right. at the history. Yeah. And if you're thinking about buying a product that you want to work for the next hundred years, you yeah. darn well better make sure it's been around at least that long. Well, and to that point, like, so I actually did a video on why uh, keeping your money inside of a whole life insurance policy was more important now than ever. Um, and mm -hmm. the reason for that, because like a lot of people are worried about like the CBDC, uh, they're worried about the devaluation of the dollar. They're worried about the world's reserve currency status loss. I'm not so like freaked out about that stuff because I think, you know, there's a, there's a, that's a, that's a whole different video to get into that. Right. Like, but, but I'm, I'm personally not so worried about this stuff, but I am a nerd, um, you know, when it comes to like doing history and stuff of that nature. And I look at, when I look at um, the foundation of the whole life, the participating whole life insurance industry, as we know it today. And, and I'm not just talking theory, because you're right, you could stretch and you could find companies with similarities or, you know, that like kind of function the same way. But I'm talking about, and you could do that for like literally 600 years. But I'm talking about the companies that we are working with and dealing with today that we still have access to that have been around since 1842, right? So that's 180 years. And when you look at them, the companies that we can still represent right now, 
Right. Those companies have been around since 1842. And that like a lot of times gets thrown around flippantly, like, hey, like 1842, 180 years. But like slow down and think about what that means. That means and and so for a lot of people, they don't realize what that means. For me, I go, well, what was 1842? That was 20 years before Lincoln was president. <laughs> 20 years before the Civil War. 20 wow. years, right? So think about this. 20 years before the Civil War, what happened? And so now you got to dig deeper because I love history, right? Like, so like what happened during the Civil War? The, the dollar crashed. They had to print right. tons of money. They had to change the currency completely. So you're talking an industry in its infancy that had such good monetary strategies and structures that they survived it and were able to handle a complete transition from one currency to the next. That's pretty cool. That's so I powerful. That before. Yeah. Like so powerful. And then what happened? <laughs> in in and that was in in the 1860s. And then in the 1870s, go do the research. In the 1870s, they had to create another version of the dollar. There was another transition. So that was two cents. And then what happened? In and then we had in 1907, there was a crash. And then, you know, there's the, all the 1913 stuff that happened, the institution, the Federal Reserve Act, and all that stuff. That's the third version of the dollar. So life insurance companies have managed three transitions of currencies already. So when we think about what are we doing? When we, we what when I think about insurance, what are the, what is the number one job of an insurance company is to manage risk, right? Yep, that's it. Get you the best yep. possible return with the least amount of risk possible. And 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 like, are they going to be sexy returns? No, they're not going to be sexy returns. Go do something else if you want it. Like, borrow against it, leverage it however you want, or 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 take a different portion of your uh, income and take risk with it elsewhere. This is the foundational asset that you should have in your life that that is not focused on risk. And, and and they they manage risk. And so like, if you're looking at savings, right? And you're worried about that. Well, yeah, like to me, I could say, I'm gonna keep my money at Chase Bank or like in a different, you know, kind of asset that's safe, that has a lot of the same profile as a whole life policy. But then I have to worry about all these other things. For everybody that's worried about all the things that we talked about with the CBDC and the devaluation and digital currency and all that stuff, I could keep it in in, in a bank and try to manage it on my own. Or I could give it to an insurance company that's shown over 180 years that they know how to manage this risk. They're managing billions and billions and billions of dollars. They've got teams of people that my mindset is if and when it gets to a point where these risks are real and the viability of the digital currencies are to the point where there's going to be practical application on a massive scale that's impactful and, and and to your life, not just in a hyperbole basis or a hype basis, but actual basis, like in real life execution kind of terms, the life insurance company is going to be way ahead of you or me in pivoting and managing that risk because that's what they do. You know, so why would I not want to keep my money there? Yep. I mean, who, you know, along that line, who who, who doesn't have insurance on their car? Right. Is, is that anywhere close to the kind of asset we're talking about when we talk about our ability to work, our human life, economic value? It's not right. even close. And yet yep. we would never self-insure our car. And so <laughs> why would we want to self-insure our greatest asset? Why not use a, a, a company that is a professional in that field, right? Yeah. Um, and the thing about it is when we look at that and we understand that those guarantees have to be there, just like you expect to be paid if something happens to you on your car, yeah. you expect to be paid on the other side, right? And so why can't we expect that from our whole life, from our life insurance, actually, from yeah. our permanent life insurance? It should pay that. And that's what whole life guarantees to happen. And when this, here's my concern, biggest concern on the and it's, it's really UL. It's the chassis. It's yeah. not the I. It's not the V for right. variable. It's not it's not those pieces. The chassis is still the same. And yeah. it's failed continuously. And they just keep putting new lipstick on it, right, with a new version. Who knows what the next one's going to be? I don't, I, you know, I don't know. But, but it's the same problem all along. And the insurance industry gets dinged. And we can look at that and say, well, that's... That's bad because the insurance company gets a bad name for themselves. We can look at it as for an insurance agent, it's bad for their, for the, you know, for their well-being because they have a hard time selling. That that is bad, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is it help, it hurts 
generations yep. of Americans and yep. people in other countries as well, whoever has you know that insurance in other places, but it hurts them at a core because mm -hmm. a problem there might cause three, four, five generations to never trust life insurance and not have any, or, or be in a position to say, no, whatever happens, I am not talking to a life insurance oh. guy because my parents or my grandparents had this policy. It was supposed to last forever and it came apart. Okay. So that blight is so much bigger than even hurting the industry because it hurts the consumer. It hurts the general public of having the perfect tools in place to have the best strategy for a long life. Right. It's yeah. It's just fuel on the next Dave Ramsey fire, you know, like, unfortunately, it just, it, it is, you know, and it's, uh, it's sad. And so like, that's why, that's why I just, I, I mean, I, I just feel so lucky to talk to you guys, um, you know, and, and I, I just, I, I hope we stay in more contact, you know, it was great meeting you guys. And, and I really think uh, we need to stick together and we need to create more content and we need to get more information out there and more people need to read Kim's book, you know, and like, and, you know, that kind of stuff, like, and, and agents need to get your software and like really understand it. Because like, I will say like, for me, everybody's different, right? Like everybody uses it different. I'm a very conceptual seller, but I kind of also am the kind of person that sees life on a spreadsheet. Like I'm a very numbers driven person. That's what makes me really good at poker, right? Like, it's like, I, I see numbers. <laughs> in, and, and so, you know, I used like, I remember using your software, I've used some other software too. But it, and, and I, the, the, the coolest part about what you do and what I would really encourage everybody to go and get truth concepts for, especially if you're new in this business, especially if you're like looking to get your business to the next level is for your self conviction, for you to yep. really understand this, because I will say now I never use calculators in a sales thing anymore, right? There was a period of time that I did. I never do any more, but when you do it enough for a period of time, you hit a level of confidence and conviction where you know the numbers to be a truth at a certain level. And that's where I guess probably your name truth concepts comes from, right? Like it's like you build that conviction and you understand it so intimately and intuitively and you just know and you have that confidence. And when you know you can speak to somebody, like it changes as an agent and as a, as a coach it changes how you show up for that person. And one of, one of the, one of the comments I heard um, at, at a conference, um, do you guys know who Dean Graziosi is? Oh, oh yeah. 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 So Dean, Dean lives right down the street from me. And like, and, and um, you know, one, one of the things Dean says all the time is like, you have to believe in what you're doing so much that not talking to people is doing them a disservice. Oh, if I you, love that. <laughs> if you don't believe in what you do to that level, you can never show up powerfully enough doing this job. Make no mistake about it. What we do is hard work. Like it's not easy. It's no, we're not taking the easy path doing, doing it the way that we're doing it. But it's but so it's the right path. It's the right path. And it's so important. But the only way you are going to succeed as an agent is to be wildly convicted. And that's where I think the power of what Todd is doing and his calculators is to help you build that conviction and the only way you're going to have that conviction is to, to increase your competency. So Brendan Burchard, you guys know Brendan? So yes. <laughs> Brendan talks about the confidence, competence loop all the time. The more confident you become or the, and the more confidence you can include, right? And then you build your competence, i.e. the calculators, you become more confident, you make a greater impact, you get to the next level, you do more studying, you know, and it just goes back and forth. And, and that actually my Life 180 logo is like the infinity sign. And that's kind of part of what inspired that, that concept um is what inspired part of the logo and so it's like doing that you you have a, an obligation i think agents have an obligation uh to to push themselves to get to that level of competence and a lot of people are like chris i just wish i could you know communicate like you do about all this stuff and probably i'm sure kim you hear that all the time right like and it's like if they knew that the thousands of hours that it takes to like really go down this <laughs> stuff and understand it and and like to get to the point where like literally you probably wake up like dreaming about it and sleep like thinking about it. Like when you wake up, like it's, you start to like just speak in this stuff and just think in, in these terms. Right. And like, um, yeah. And, and, and so I, I just think it's so important. So, and I, and I, I, I really think you guys are two of the best people in the industry doing some amazing things. And I just, uh, 
I don't know how we didn't meet earlier, quite frankly. Um, it is amazing. Uh, and we're so grateful for your good work. Oh, too, yeah. Because get, getting the message out there takes all of us. Yep. And I want to just wrap up with a sentence, an equation, actually, all on my right. own. It doesn't have numbers in it, though. Okay. <laughs> um, and that, and I just, this just popped into my head recently, even though okay. I've worked this with my practice since the beginning of time, the equation just popped into my head and it's whole life plus term insurance equals human life value. Mm. So we talked earlier about convertible term insurance and cheap term insurance, and there is a difference and they're both important because for some people, all they can deal with is cheap term insurance. And then that's what they should have. But if they can take a little bit of a step up and they get convertible term insurance or switchable term insurance, in case people might not know what that term is, then they have the opportunity to have term insurance now, whole life later, whether or not they've had a change in health. Mm -hmm. But our whole life friendly communities are doing clients a big disservice by not bringing in the human life value aspect of life insurance. We've gotten all caught up in the cash. Mm -hmm. And so if you say the equation with just the letters, it rhymes W L plus T equals H L V. Nice. (laughs) Nice. I like it. That's amazing. Have you done a video on that? Uh, No, that's a great idea. I'll have to make a note. Do it. Do it. Well, that's, uh, that's awesome. I think that's fantastic. Is that, are you putting that in your book or have you done? That isn't anywhere. I kid you not. That is, that is two, three weeks ago, fresh. That's Um, awesome. I'll just go with, thank you, father, mother, God for the idea. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah. You got to do a video on that though, because that's, uh, that's just get it out there more. Um, Well said. That's awesome. So, all right, Todd, anything, anything last from you? No, I I just really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate you getting out there. I appreciate you really pushing something that's that's so important for people to understand that distinction. It's just not the same thing, the UL, the whole life. And we need to know what the difference is. We need to be in a place where we're really helping people get ahead. And that's 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 where it has to be. And I, I. I don't do that enough. I'm sure. I mean, I can, I can give you the numbers. I can look at those pieces and parts, but we need your yeah. voice out there. Really, really pushing it. Well, so if you thank guys you. ever need me anywhere on any platform, I'm happy to go, you know, attack some IUL agents. Just let me know. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's what I do. So um, that's awesome. Well, all right, guys, if you guys need um, anything from uh, Todd or Kim, or you're interested in her book, or you want to check out Truth Concepts or like any of the stuff, I'm going to put all of their information in the link uh, in the description below. I'll have all the links and all the different ways that you can get a hold of them. Uh, So don't worry about it. You don't have to go scour the internet for it. We'll put all the most important links that they want you to have access to and ways to get a hold of them and all that stuff uh, right down below. And uh, that's it for now. So until next video, guys, have a blessed, inspirational day. Thanks for being here. This is a long one, but it was hopefully added a lot of value. And we'll see you next time. See ya.